So if you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn with me to Exodus, Exodus chapter 8, verse 1. Exodus chapter 8, verse 1. It's almost as if we are, and I think that's a good way to learn our Bibles, is to jump into the text and, um, and place yourself inside of that text. It doesn't matter if it's a, you know, what you'd say, a good character or a bad character. <clears throat> it's okay to put yourself in both of them. What would that be like to be there? And uh, how, how, what can I learn from uh, their response? And so we're going to learn from Israel a lot as we uh, keep moving forward in Exodus. But tonight, we're really going to learn a lot uh, from Pharaoh and his response to God. So uh, let's begin in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go. How many times would God have, should God have to tell him to let his people go? It's only by his grace that he'll tell him more than once. But he is going to tell him more than once because he's making an example out of him. That they may serve me, they're mine. If you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you tonight. That's a good thing, Lord, to, be, uh, to burn into our hearts, is that you are the Lord God, and we are to obey you. It's a great, one of the great things we can learn in this life is that you are God and we're your creation and we're made to obey and to worship you. Just needs to be settled and done. But Lord, for some reason, we keep putting ourselves back on the throne of our lives. So teach us tonight, remind us of these basic things that can change the entire course of our lives. So we pray that, we ask your blessing over your word we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. So, thus saith the Lord. Again, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. Don't know, we don't know exactly know how to pronounce it. Some say Jehovah, some say Yahweh. Um, there's several different variances of the same thing because we don't know what the vowels are. It was a holy word, and they would not write it, so they just wrote the uh, consonants, not the, the vowels. So... <clears throat> That was Israel, and so we don't uh, really know the exact pronunciation, but it doesn't really uh, matter because every time we hear this for the next pages here, and we're going to see this on and on throughout the history of Israel, um, I, I made a little count here, 67 times in these 10 plagues uh, will this word uh, Lord be used, not only for Pharaoh's sake, but also for Israel's sake. They're getting to know their God, aren't they? And so he's already told Moses, I tell him I am has sent you. Okay? So each time I'm, I'm seeing that in the text, I'm reminded that for Pharaoh, you need, to, you need to know who the Lord is. He's the great I am, which means he doesn't need anything else to be said about him. He is God. He's the Lord God. Now, there's... This is the third time that uh, Moses um, and Aaron go before him. And so um, each time we'll see that Pharaoh is learning, even in his willful rebellion, and he's taking a lot of things in here, and God is demonstrating to him who he is. The first time he said, well, who is the Lord? And so, well, who is this Lord? Um, I don't know the Lord. And uh, by the time we're done, he'll, he's going to know the Lord really well, right? And, and then the second time, um, it says in Exodus, by, by this, this is what the message was for Moses, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. I'm going to make sure you know it. And by the time I'm done striking you and your people, you will know uh, who I am. Now the third time, um, 
he said to him, now if you still don't know who I am and you refuse to let my people go, then I will smite your people with frogs. So they've already been, uh, blood is the first one. And now, um, which is really a reminder that um, that's judgment. It's the blood of judgment. It's not the blood of redemption. We'll see that at the end. But um, God it controls all life and it's in his hands and he can judge it and he will be the judge of everything. And now the second one is, uh, again, frogs. So interesting. Uh, verse three says, the Nile will swarm with frogs which will come up and go into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into your houses, um, the houses of your servants and on your people and into your ovens <laughs> and into your kneading bowls. Anybody here afraid of frogs? I don't know if there's a, that's a big phobia there. Um, I kind of think they're kind of neat, you know, frogs, but maybe not in the kneading bowl, right? You kind of get a little surprised, you, you, know, you know, pull out the bowl, little frogs in there looking at you. And uh, so it's pretty invasive, isn't it? And, and so he says, listen, they're going to be in your house all the way in your kneading bowl. So the frogs will come up on you and your people and all your servants. Now, it's going to get personal with Pharaoh um, even as, it, as we progress. But even now, he's faced with a thing of saying, I'm going to do this to you. And you can't stop it. I'm going to do this to you, and you have no way to stop it. You won't be able to keep them out of your own bed. They'll be in your bed. You think you're so powerful? You think you're so great? You won't be able to keep even frogs out of your own room, not to mention the rest of your land, um, because I will do this to you. It's a complete violation, and God is, again, um, embarrassing him and humiliating him because of his refusal to obey him. And um, it, if you're not going to let my people go, it's going to cost your people. So we're going to see, though, that they started out the first time they came. They said, all right, well, if you've got so much time on your hands and you want to go worship God, then I'm going to make sure your people are, are a little bit busier. So they're going to make bricks now, but I'm not going to give them any hay. They're going to have to go get their own hay. So he was able to say, all right, you want something from me? I'm going to punish your people for it. Um, for your God, I'm going to punish your people. Now it's reversed, isn't it? And God says, no, no. Um, I'm going to punish you and your people. And every time you refuse to let them go, it's going to get worse for you and for your uh, people. And that's the power of God. So he's making a, a clear demarcation a line is being drawn in the sand, and there's several lessons, so let's just grab a hold of these, because this is going to be repetitive. We're going to see the same things kind of going on over and over with each plague. <clears throat> a few interesting things will be coming out, but just remember this. This whole section reminds us of one thing. There's only one God. Amen. There's never been more than one God. I mean, we're not that far along in the history of the world, right? We've been reading it. Man knows there's only one God. Every man knows there's only one God. God says he tells them. So they have to deny it and to believe the lie. It only makes sense. There can only be one God who created everything. There cannot be two gods. The idea of polytheism is ridiculous. I mean, you know, it makes no sense at all that all of these gods of Egypt are all, you know, uh, um, divine. There isn't any. And so this is a great reminder. Um, there are no others. The other ones are phony, powerless before the one true God. Number two, the heart of man is very rebellious. We're going to watch Pharaoh with his heart. It is un really unimaginable that you would think that everyone would relent if all of these things were happening in their life. But it's going to be a reminder to us that is how rebellious the heart of man is. That's not the heart God gives us. When we come to him, he makes us, gives us a new one, right? But this is the one that we have. Now, he, he's not saying some men, it's every one of us have that heart. 
So start on, when you're going through this, don't, don't look to everybody else. Just put yourself in that place. And there's a lot of places to put yourself. Number three, the last one is, the power of God is great to deliver his people. They'll never have to wonder how much power God has. Does he have enough to get us through? Israel's watching. But also, we're going to see this, is that he has it power to judge his enemies. He has plenty of power to judge everyone who says, I will not bow to you. <clears throat> I will not obey you. Nations, people, anything. And so we'll learn all three of those lessons. Verse five, then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams and over the pools. Remember, they were all bloody and now they're starting to clear up. For seven days, they were blood. He says, now stretch your hand out back over them again, over the pools, and, and make frogs come up out of the, the land, on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came and covered the land of Egypt. Now, for those of you who forgot this, um, Moses is speaking for God as God. <laughs> Here's what God says. I'm a spokesman. And then Aaron is again re, uh, giving it again. Um, he's the public speaker. And then when it says his staff, he's speaking of Moses' staff, but, but Aaron's got it and he's doing all this again <clears throat> only because Moses wouldn't do it um, and didn't trust God to be able to, to have him do it. So don't worry about mixing and matching them. They're both a tandem team here as we uh, look through. So, uh, no more bloody waters. Frogs begin to emerge by the million. So this is pictorial. Um, I don't have a picture of a million frogs, but in your mind, you can picture them everywhere you walk, everywhere you step. The magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, entreat the Lord that he remove the frogs <clears throat> from me and from my people, and I will let... The people go, that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Now, wait a minute here. I thought you said you don't know the Lord. You don't know who he is. Um, you want who to remove the frogs? Why don't you remove the frogs? If you're so powerful, and your magicians are so powerful, and your gods are so powerful, by the way... <clears throat> Who's the gods uh, uh, of the frogs here? As we'll see here, the frogs, the goddess of the frogs, is, was a big god for Egypt. I'm not going to explain every one of their gods because they're nothing. They're just something that they made something of. But again, they're powerless to do anything. The, the goddess of, of the frogs is the one who could breathe life. The frog goddess breathes life and gives man life. So it's ironic that at the end here, um, we're going to see that all the frogs die. So, so not only can they not give anyone else life and their God, but they're dead. And that's exactly the example of their gods. They're dead gods, and uh, they can't do anything about it. So why don't you ask the Nile gods to remove the frogs? Um, but again, they can't do it. Now, can the ma ma magicians do it? No, they can't do it either. In fact, all they can do is make more. All they can do is make more. Now, let me just give you, a, a, um, again, a reminder. And I think we know this already. False religions. That means every other religion, every other way to God, but through his word and through his son, Every other seeking of God through any other method is a false method to a false God. False priests that represent those false gods, they're powerless to deliver anybody, okay, from the hand of God or to deliver them in any way. So that's the sad thing about all men's pursuit of their religions. There's nobody there to help them. They cannot be helped. And in fact... The Bible says that there's not even an interest of the gods to help them. And man, at, at his best, which is these magicians, they can only make it worse. 
they weren't decreasing the flow of frogs. They were increasing the flow of frogs in their small way to try to uh, replicate that. And again, a reminder here, Satan is powerful. He's beyond our power. He can do the miraculous, miraculous signs and wonders. And so it is very deceptive, but it doesn't help you. No, it doesn't. It leaves you worse off than you were before. He comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He's not interested in doing any good thing for your life. He wants to crush you. And that's where Egypt is, and that's where Pharaoh is. And they can turn to anyone that they want, but there's nobody there to help them. them. Verse 9, Moses says to Pharaoh, the honor is yours to tell me. Then shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs be destroyed from you and your houses, that they may be left only in the Nile. Okay, Pharaoh, you're, you want power and you want authority here. God's going to give you some. He's going to give you power in this situation to do what? He says, the honor is yours. You get to choose how long you have the frogs. I'm going to give you that power. You tell me when you've had enough, right? When do you want the torment to stop? That's interesting. It's your call. The, the, the Lord's going to give you that choice. And uh, how long do you want to be, um, again, tormented by this plague? And what does he say in verse 10? Then he said, tomorrow. Tomorrow? It makes no sense. Why do you want to go another day in your torment? There's, no, there's nothing sensible about that. And, but that's the true reality of man, right? It's always one more day with my sin. I'll repent tomorrow. Just give me one more night, you know, uh, as they say, with the frogs, right? May I have one more day in my sin and my pride, and that's exactly, there's no explanation of it, but that is humanity, isn't it? You look at people in situations and you go, um, for me as a pastor, I, I look and I say, do you realize the immense amount of pain and suffering you're causing yourself simply because you, you won't obey God and you know what to do? And God's put all of it in your lap and you get to decide and you're gonna tell me um, you're not ready yet, how much can you endure? I think I've said that at least three times this last week of the conversations that I've had. I mean, not to, not to the people I'm talking to, but on the way I'm thinking to myself, I can't take that much pain. I don't know how their pain tolerance gets so high. I mean, I, I don't think I want to be in that much uh, suffering uh, a day in, day out. I can't take it. I'm too big a baby. It doesn't matter what I gotta do. I'm going to do whatever I got to do because there's nothing better than laying down in bed at night and knowing I've repented and I've turned to the Lord and, and I put everything before him and I get to go to sleep. I don't want to sleep another night with the frogs, right? And uh, I mean, really, it's, 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 but it's part of the, one of the strangest things about um, humanity there is like, it's like, well, I think I could take another night. I could probably do another night. All right. If you want another night, you can have another night. Um, you're crazy, but you can have it if you want. Um, spend another night with the frogs. So he said, may it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They will be left only in the Nile. They're going to go, there are only going to be those that were already in the Nile, but all the ones that are up on the land, they're going uh, to die. So but here's what he says. That you may know that there is no one like the Lord. There's no one like him. Going to be burned into his uh, mind. It isn't going to change his heart though, but it is going to be burned into his mind. Verse 12, then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. The Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, the courts, and the fields. So they piled them in heaps, and the land became foul. You ever see a heap of frogs? 
Ever been frog gigging? Okay. All right, just, just wondering. We still got a few okies left here. <clears throat> frog gigs, get a little pile of frogs, cook them up. Frog legs, right? Some of you are licking your lips. Okay. All right. And the frogs died. And out of the houses, the courts, and the fields, so they piled them up. And then it says here, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them as the Lord had said. You know what the problem with one more night is? (laughs) Is that the conviction is there now. And you know you need to repent now. But oftentimes, through one more night, you can find some way to get a little bit of relief. And if you can get a little bit of relief, you go, well, I don't think I need to do it now then. And it begins to put off. But here's what happens. Your heart grows a little harder. We should take the conviction of the Holy Spirit because it's, it's a gift from God when he convicts your, our hearts. Especially unto salvation. And that's primarily uh, here the most important part when he's saying, you need to surrender to me. You need to surrender to me. If you keep putting that off, your heart continues to get hard. And as we'll see here, there's a lot of con- consequences to a very hard heart. Verse thir- um, 13, <clears throat> the frogs died. The Egyptians regarded the frogs, again, as having this divine power. And now uh, not only could their God... Uh, Again, deliver them from the frogs, but now the frogs have all died. So again, the people are watching this of Egypt, and they're also learning as well. And uh, but so here, God has killed their life-giving frog god, and um, you know now the world's come to an end. Um, Plus, they got the plague as well. But as soon as he got relief, again, he's like, "Well, I think I could do this a little bit longer." Now, if you look at him and you say. I don't, I can't relate to that. I don't see, that's got to be a unique thing in all of the Bible that, you know, here he is faced with this and all of this plague and pestilence and then and he's saying, no, listen, I'll, I'll take some more. Now, here's a quotation from Jeremiah 13, 10, and 11. Now, here's what God writes. He writes this about Israel This is years down the road, as if they haven't learned these lessons already, right? Here's what Jeremiah writes about them. The wicked people, (laughs) that's Israel, the wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, so God's addressing them through the prophet, they refuse to obey my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts. And have gone after other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. Are you crazy? You've already learned the greatest lesson you could ever learn. By the way, as we see this here, this lesson was, again, put upon Egypt as in the mightiest nation on the earth. So their nation, the nation of Israel, begins by God demonstrating his power over all of Israel's enemies. That he can crush them. And deliver them. Now, as we see Israel go out throughout the rest of their history, we're going to read about them. (laughs) We're not going to see this again. We'll see it in small things that God will deliver them from this little thing or that little thing. But from this point on, as God deals with Israel as a nation, for the rest of the history of the world, the next three times that God has to deal with them, it's going to be the opposite. He's going to be expelling them. And he's going to be, again, judging them with great judgments. And the nations are going to inflict it upon them. So that's the, nation, that's the history of Israel. Because they would not obey the Lord. They would not serve him. They began to go after other gods. And God said, listen, you're, you're no different than any human. I've set you apart, but you're no better than any other man. I'll do the same for you as I do for any other nation. Um, I will judge you, and God has. And it's been harsh. But now we're coming to the end of this history. And God says, one more time, I'm going to call you. And he's going to call them home, and they're home. They're coming home from all over the world, back in the land. And you know what? We're setting up a scene that all the world is once again going to come. 
again against him, like this scene that we see here. And God's going to say, I'm going to show you my power. And it finally, their hearts will be turned to him. And he says, watch how I deliver you. And that's the book of Revelation, right? And the end of the book of Revelation. So we're seeing the beginning. And then we can flash forward. And now we're at the end. And now there are, again, a picture for us to see. God, the God of Israel is the only God. And he's the God who gave us his son, Jesus. And that's the only salvation. And he's the only deliverer. It's very powerful. But he says, um, here's what it says. I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people for renown, for praise, for glory. But they did not listen. I made you an example to the whole world of my greatness and my power and I wanted to lavish that on you so the whole world could see, turn to God and look at the beauty of of the God of Israel. But you've made a mockery of all of that and now uh, they mock the God of Israel because you've turned to other gods. Let's go to verse 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth. We're gonna go to round three, okay? That it may become gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. Uh, They did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats through all the land, throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, we're not exactly sure what a gnat is. Now, gnats don't seem too bad, right? They're so small. Some of you are like, I don't like gnats especially like hordes of gnats. I'm not sure, and we're not sure that it is. I, I, I think it's fleas that come out of the sand. I don't think gnats necessarily come out of the sand, but fleas do, don't they? So it's either gnats or fleas, or it could possibly be mosquitoes. So you can take your pick. And you, as you imagine it, I'm doing fleas, okay? So fleas. Now they're on everyone, man and beast, just doused with fleas. They ever feel sorry for your dog when it has like three fleas, you know? It's like driving him crazy. You can imagine being infested with fleas and you're looking at your dog and (laughs) he's got fleas, but you got more than he has. Sad, isn't it? (laughs) Who's going to comfort who? See how good man's best friend is, right? The the magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth gnats, uh, fleas, but they could not. So there were fleas on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the hand of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now it's the guys that he's turning to are saying, no, this is God. We can't do that one. And, uh, but again, he's refusing to yield to God. And uh, really what he's doing is he's just denying his own reality. Now, that, that's, that's an important thing to notice, that our rebellion can reach a point where now you're just denying reality. It's like you're looking at your life and, and everybody else can see, hey, man, we're, this, it's over. I mean, look, this... We've caused all of this to happen, but you're the only one who acts like, no, no, everything's fine. But everybody in your life can look and tell you, no, it isn't fine, and this is a mess, and here's what's going on, Uh, and you're the one that acts like you're oblivious to it. Why? That's just the power of deception and sin, that you act like, uh, yeah, everything is fine, and everybody around you knows you're a mess. Everything is a mess. But again, that's pride at its height, right? You just ask your, yourself. I just remembered Hogan's Heroes. Anybody ever see that? Sergeant Schultz, he says, I hear nothing, right? I see nothing. Yes, you do. You see it. You hear it. It's hilarious, but not so funny when it's in our lives, right? And we're the only one who can't see uh, what God is doing. It's the finger of God. It's his command. And they know that it is God. But again, that heart is very hard. Now the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and present your, um, yourself before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go. 
that they may serve me. For if you do not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and on your servants and on your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of flies and also the ground on which they dwell. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen. I don't think he's dawning on him that, you know what, uh, Egypt is suffering, but Israel's not. And now he's letting them know, hey, listen, um, by the way, this is for your eyes only, okay? You're the only ones that are seeing this. And uh, you're, you're, you're the one who's going to have to face this. They are not going to see any of this destruction. And um, so um, there's a distinction that's being made. He says, I'm going to set them apart where my people are living. Because I can do whatever I want to my people, and I can do whatever I want to your people. Because your people are my people. I control everything, and you can't do anything about it. Because before, you could stretch out your hand, and you made my people make bricks with, with a, without the straw and have to gather themselves. You thought you were so great. Well, now, I'm going to do the same thing to you, and you won't be able to touch my people. And I'm going to withhold from them because they're my people. So that the swarm of flies will be there in order that you may know that I, I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign will occur. Now, a couple of interesting things. Flies, okay. What is the big deal about flies, right? It doesn't seem so bad, does it? Okay. Well, let's read here, verse 24. So then the Lord did, did so, and there came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and the houses of the servants, and the land was laid waste because of the swarm of flies in all the land of Egypt. Now, how do flies lay waste to the land there? Well, if you think about this, I don't know if you ever watch flies even like on horses. They're just irritating. And, and, you know, just my dad has horses and, and uh, sometimes the flies and even the mosquitoes too, but uh, they get so intense that they just, they agitate the animal and they, almost, they don't get any rest if they just continue on you all together. But there are some things you can put on them that to keep the flies away there, but it is that uh, debilitating. But you can imagine if there were swarms of them and they're just being swarmed every minute of every day. It ex- completely exhausts them, doesn't it? And, uh, and you know what? They'll, an animal will go almost just kill himself trying to get out of all of that. And so very, um, um, again, an- annoying to the point of death, right? And could you be annoyed uh, to the point of death? Well, Proverbs says you, you can. I'd like to read you a proverb. It says, a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. So um, we can even annoy each other, can't we? Not, not my wife. That's somebody else's wife. But I pity the, the guy who has that. But it's like a... You know, you'd be laying there in a rainstorm if you got that gutter that just makes that sound, you know, and that's all you can hear and it begins to drive you crazy. Isn't that the old torture thing? You just drop a little thing on your forehead, right? It just drive you insane and drive you crazy. So that's a little bit, it doesn't have anything to do with you ladies. There just happened to be a proverb that had the same illustration. It's just It's kind of a bummer when you know so many scriptures, you know, I, I can Rolodex them and go, hey, I, I heard something like that. Yeah, that's right. The dripping faucet wife. Okay. Verse 25. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and he said, go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, it is not right for you to do so, for we will sacrifice to the Lord our God what is an abomination to the Egyptians. So if you're paying attention here, Pharaoh says, all right, well, hold on. Let's make a deal. Tell you what. You go sacrifice to your God in the land. Let's just, I'll meet you halfway, okay? You can, you can worship your God, just do it here, 
okay? He says, no, that's not right. Um, the, and plus, whatever we do, we're gonna, it's going to be an abomination in front of the rest of the Egyptians as we see these sacrifices there. It's going to offend their gods and all of that as well. He says, if we sacrifice what, sacrifice what is an abomination to the Egyptians before their eyes, then uh, will they not stone us? They're going to want to kill us. We must go three days journey out into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he commands us. Pharaoh said, I will let you go. Negotiation. Okay. I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you should not go very far. But you can't go three days away. Um, so make supplication for me. In other words, I got to get these flies off my back. So um, I, I'm, I'm willing to negotiate a little bit, right? Just don't go far away. Now here's what the Bible teaches about that. Partial obedience is still disobedience. God says, there's a reason why I've asked this of you and half of it is not what I'm asking. I want the entire thing uh, of obedience. The commands of God are not negotiable and you're in no place to negotiate and neither are we, right, uh, uh, to negotiate with God. We learned this lesson in 1 Samuel because Saul thought he could make a deal with God. God said, you go and you destroy these people and you don't take anything. It's a symbol that I have, it's my judgment is, is upon them and I've passed my judgment and it is thorough and it is complete. And of course, when he goes there, uh, he does you know, the thing, he destroys uh, most of the people but then takes some back and some of the choice cattle and all of that. And Samuel looks at that and he says, what have you done? And he begins to talk about this negotiation. Well, I thought it would be good if I brought the best things back and then I sacrificed those here before the Lord. And you think, well, you know, that's not too bad. I mean, he kind of did most of what God had asked him to do. But listen to what Samuel said to him. Samuel replied, does the, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? And then he says, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams, for rebellion is like the sin of divination. It's like, it's demonic. That's what rebellion is. It's its own thing of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. It's arrogant to say, God, I don't have to do everything you say, but I'll do some, and I'm going to decide what I'm going to do. But when I tell you, when I was reading this, I was just thinking about myself. Because when God tells me something to do something, what category should it go in? Optional? Negotiable? Right? And especially the commands of God. I have to remember, it, it's the one who made me is asking this of me. Who am I to say, well, I'll do that later, or I'll do that when I get around to it, or God, right now, I'm busy, or whatever it is in my life. Um, man, it just reminded me that, God, when you say something, it's the same thing as you speaking to Pharaoh. You're God, and if you've asked this of me, who am I to negotiate? We can't negotiate. Then Moses said, behold, I'm going out from you, and I shall make, verse 29, supplication to the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. Only do not let Pharaoh deal deceitfully again um, in not letting the people go uh, to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh, and he made supplication to the Lord. Um, the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people, not one remained. Isn't that amazing? But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also, and he did not let the people go. Each time they're removed, again, he gets a little bit of reprieve, and he catches a second wind, and he's, again, back to his same self. Surprise, surprise, right? Verse 1 rolls right in. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and speak to him. Thus says the Lord, the God of <laughs> the Hebrews, let my people go. 
that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. The Lord set a definite time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. Now, first of all, let me say this. <clears throat> Somebody asked me once, we're talking about the suffering of animals. Animals suffer, don't they? They suffer as a part of the fall. In Romans chapter 8, it says, listen, this is, this is a bite. God subjected this world into suffering because of the sinfulness of man. It's a good illustration of it, isn't it? These animals are going to suffer because you will not obey God. And God says, I'm willing to allow them to suffer. I mean, it really is, it really is an incredible thing there um, as a statement there that when we look, and I re remember I, one of the, I talk about this debate all the time uh, at MJC. They were, um, you know, conservationists and people that were trying to save the planet and all of that. And they're like, well, what does your Bible say about saving the planet? You know, you know, um, says, well, if you want to save the planet, then you need to repent and come to Jesus. If you don't, again, he's going to destroy it all because it's only suffering because of you and me. It's the only reason that it's suffering. What do you want to do about it? You don't want to repent, do you? Right? And I say, well, I don't, I'm not going to repent. Yeah, but if you're the cause of it, and this is exactly what was happening with Pharaoh, God allows this to happen. He's going to restore this order, praise the Lord, and then and the whole earth will be changed, which will be great. But up until now, that's the way that it goes. And so um, a definite time tomorrow. Now, what he does is he flips this over a little bit. Last time he says, you, 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 you make the timetable. You decide how much suffering you want to endure. I'll let you decide. And so he's, well, okay, I guess I'll, t tomorrow I'll take one more day, right? This time he says, um, okay, now I'm going to make the timetable. And um, I'm going to start the next suffering tomorrow. Tomorrow. And so you've got until tomorrow to decide if you want to start suffering again. That's a little bit different, right? Before you are suffering, you're like, well, how much can I take? And the other one is, listen, judgment is coming. Do you want to avoid it or not? Now, I think both of those things are true in life, aren't they? And that's the state where we are as man. We can say, you know, God, I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to relent. And God says, listen, um, judgment is coming. And I'm going to tell you right now that if you die and you reject the love, my love, my opportunity to save you, I will judge you. And it's coming. And you can't stop it. Now what are you going to do? And that's the truth. I know we don't like to hear that. But the truth is we are perishing from our own rebellion, from our own sin. Not because of God's anger toward us. He wants to save us. He would like to see this thing happen uh, here. It could happen by before tomorrow because he could relent and say, no, no, I'm not going to put anybody through any more suffering. I don't want to go through any more suffering. I relent. And you could do that. And that's the opportunity that was there. But again, uh, he does not want to do that. Tomorrow, the Lord will do this thing. So you don't have long to think about it. There isn't going to be a long reprieve before the next one starts. So what do you want to do? A lot of pressure uh, the Bible says God's given, uh, appointed a man once to die and then judgment. You're going to die and, and you'll stand before me. So we really have to be honest to say, listen, God, um, you're giving me the opportunity, but it's now. Verse six, the Lord did this thing on the next day. He did it, didn't he? Just like he said he was going to do it. And the livestock of Egypt died but of the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. Not one. 
Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not even one of the livestock of Israel dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. So, lesson here. Did the Lord do what he said? Yeah. I like that in the story of the Garden of Eden, because he tells him, and he says, Adam, don't eat of this tree. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then, of course, Adam ate of the tree. And the Bible says that day he died within and his relationship was cut off from God. And you look at the sorrow and the cost of all of it. Was God telling the truth? Satan was the one who was lying. You shall not surely die, right? So he tells us that you're not going to stand before God. There won't be judgment before God. Listen, Satan is a liar. God will be true. Everything that he says, he's going to do it. He's going to do it just like he said he would do it. He never lies. Why listen to a liar? Because that's what Satan does. And our own hearts want to lie and say, oh, I don't think God's ever really going to hold us accountable. Yeah, he is going to hold us accountable. And, um, and we need to know that. It's very important. Um, here's what Second Peter 2 says. If the Lord did not spare the ancient world, this is during Noah's time, but preserved Noah, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, but again, he, he saved Lot, he spared him, spared righteous Lot, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Both are true. God says, listen, did I tell you I would deliver them from this? They didn't face any of it. I can deliver them out of your hand, and uh, and then I can also be faithful to do my judgment. And uh, just like I said uh, I would do, God has the power to do both, thank God, doesn't he? He has power to deliver us, and he will deliver us out. He says, I'm going to take you to heaven with me. I've got, um, you have eternal life since I breathed into you. You will not taste death. Is he lying? No, he's not lying. I will not have to taste death. To be absent from this body, I'm going to be present with the Lord. And he's got a new body for me that will be there forever. I'll have a brand new body and I'll worship the Lord forever. Is that true? Yes. Does he have the power to do that? Yes, he does have the power to do that. So praise the Lord for that. But will he really judge those who reject him and uh, stand in rebellion to him? Will he do that? Yes, he will really do that as well. Verse um, 8. Now we're on number 6. Boils all over man and beast. You ready for boils? It's like a little extra pestilence tonight. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln and let Moses throw it toward the sky. So it's kind of a creative way to give the pictorial thing here. In the sight of Pharaoh, it will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt and will become boils, breaking out with sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, again, he's increasing the intensity of these judgments. So they will... Uh, They took soot from a kiln and and stood before Pharaoh and Moses threw it toward the sky and it became boils, uh, breaking out with sores on man and beast. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of their boils, for the boils were on the magicians as well as on the Egyptians. Now, it's uh, safe to say they couldn't get rid of them, could they? All that power of Satan... You know, they were tapping into, they had no way to deliver, and Satan wasn't going to deliver them anyway. Just rest there in your boils. And so, at this point, the Lord really isn't asking anything of, of Pharaoh, is he? He's just saying, here's some more. Do you want some more? And so, that's exactly what's happening. Again, hard to picture that, but boils on everyone. And again, the pain of boils reminds you of Job, doesn't it? And he's picking his you know, boils with shards, you know, and picking his skin. You guys got a picture of that? Good. A lot of pictures. 
not all good pictures, but. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Now it says the Lord is hardening their heart. Now that's the danger of it, isn't it? The first seven times he deals with them, Pharaoh hardens his heart, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Now the Bible says, God says, I'll harden your heart. And what does that mean? Don't get overwhelmed with all of that. This doesn't have to do with the sovereignty of God. And this is not at all. And again, God knows what we're going to choose and he knows how we're going to deal with him and he knows what a hard heart is like. But the Bible says this, if we continue to deny the truth and we will not relent before God, there's the danger. It says in Romans 128 that if you do not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God says he gave them over to a reprobate or depraved mind. What does that mean? It means the mind isn't even rational anymore. It's completely oblivious. It's, it, again, once you reach that point, what a sad state that you're in. Can God reach a depraved mind? Yes, I think he can. You still reach it. But you're in a world of hurt. And that's exactly what's began to happen to Pharaoh. Verse 13, then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, guess what? Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go. Do you think he's enjoying that phrase each time he hears it? That they may serve me. For this time I will send my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me on all the earth. For if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would have then been cut off from the earth. I could have already killed you at any moment. Your life is right there in my hands. If I snap my fingers, you're gone. And isn't that true? If the Lord says you don't get another breath and we don't get another breath, how powerful are we? Could we stop him? He's our God who makes us. We're alive because he's allowed us to be alive. He's the one who numbers our days is in control. I don't have a problem with that. I am so thankful he's under control. And I'm not under control, uh, uh, in control because this would be a lousy place if I had all control, that's for sure. But God is perfect in his ways, isn't he? And he loves man and he's merciful and he could have killed them many times. That isn't the point here. The point is you need to acknowledge me, who I am. You could have already been dead. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still, you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. Behold, about this time, tomorrow. We're starting to see a lot of tomorrows, aren't we? I will send a very heavy hail such as not been seen in Egypt from the day it was found, uh, founded until now. Now, therefore, sin, bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home when the hail comes down on them will die. The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses, which means he's saying, listen, I'm dealing with you and it's costing all of your people. At this time, I'm going to be gracious to your people. And if any of them will heed my words, since you won't, then I'll spare their, their, their uh, animals. And so if they're willing to do that, and they have faith, and you, even though you do not, um, I will. God does desire to be merciful, and he wants to be merciful and he's saying, listen, I'm going to put that out to them. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. So how many, you know, if I could be brash, how many dummies do you think kept their livestock out? I mean, how dumb would you have to be to think, I don't think he's going to do it, right? But they did. Is that just crazy? What, I mean, what would make you think you're going to test... God, in the middle of all of this, bring your stuff in. Are you crazy? But they did. And many of them did. And I would say probably, again, like it is with the world, the majority of people say, I'm not going to relent. I'm not going to turn. You know? 
I don't think it's going to really happen. So here's what this also shows to us. I think this is important. Pay attention to it. The word's called mixed, the mixed multitude. The mixed multitude. So what we're seeing here is that in the middle of this, there are some in Egypt that are saying, wow, this, this is a true God. This is, this is God. I mean, they're looking at it and they have honest hearts and are saying, man, this is the one true powerful God. I wish I could serve him. I wish I could worship him. And you know what? When Israel comes out of the land, the Bible says there's going to be this mixed multitude that's going to follow them. I'm going with you. I'm going with the one true God. And so these are some of those people that are saying, listen, no, we, we know who you are. Number seven, uh, hail and fire. Uh, now the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that hail may, may fall on the land of Egypt, on the man and on the beast and on every plant in the field throughout the land of Egypt. So hail and fire. Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. That's got to be a sight to see, right? A storm with amazing hail that will crush and kill everything in its path with fire uh, accompanying it. It's almost like Sodom and Gomorrah in some ways. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, uh, very severe, such as it had not been in all of the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. The hail struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail also struck every plant of the field, and he shattered every tree of the field, just crushed it and broke it down to the ground. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, was there no hail. I think the Bible says, what, 70-pound hailstones he's going to send down as a judgment on those who attack Israel in the last days? I don't think we've seen the biggest hailstone uh, yet. But can you imagine, is, is it 70 pounds? Bible students, all right, great. That's a lot. It's a pretty big hailstone. Big enough to crush airplanes, crush advancing armies, and it's a natural, again, a way for God to use as a judgment here. Um, but again, the land of Goshen was spared. Now, so Israel's looking at all of this and going, our God's pretty awesome. We were complaining, but now we're not complaining anymore. And we're seeing that, you know what, this is the, the true uh, God. And uh, now they're, they're gathering all of this to say, listen, our God is awesome. The God of our fathers is awesome. Then Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron, and he said to them, I have sinned. Um, this time the Lord is right, uh, the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Boy, doesn't that sound good? If he only meant it, right? Okay, I'm a sinner, right? Make supplication to the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Sounds good. Moses said uh, to him, as soon as I go out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no uh, hail no longer, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not fear the Lord God. So he's catching on here, right? Now the flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not ruined, for they uh, ripened late. So God's leaving them some hope there, right? Um, not everything was gone. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and he spread out his hands to the Lord and the thunder and the hail ceased and the rain no longer poured out on the earth. Notice that Moses had to walk out of the, of the um, presence of Pharaoh there and walk out of the city. And when I get out of the city, it'll stop. So here's Moses walking out through all of that hail and fire and all of it. And he, of course, wasn't touched, was he? And uh, because, again, God was in control. And so when he got out, raised his hands, and of course, all of it was put down. And we'll read through this one quickly tonight. So don't panic. We'll make it. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, and that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and, and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Now he's saying this to Israel, isn't he? 
And you guys need to take note of this. So you're going to tell this to your kids, and to your kids' kids, and this can be passed down from generation to generation. What was God doing? Was he saying is, hey, this is going to be a great story, and you will really be able to laugh at these Egyptians for years to come. No, that's not what he was saying. He's saying, listen, you need to file all this away. Because number one, you're going to get a chance very soon to put all this into practice. Because you're watching me crush all the gods of Egypt and all the powers of the, of the earth that stand against me. And you need to file that away. Because when I ask you to take a stand against an enemy, and you need to know that I can deliver you, right? I am faithful. You can do it with me. And you also need to know that I am the God who judges. You don't want to do. You, you need to tell your, your uh, families, don't worship false idols. Don't turn from the Lord. Don't be in rebellion. Because the Lord has the power to crush as well. So both of those are things Israel needs to file away and uh, into their data bank, Right? And remember it forever. It really isn't a laughing matter here. Very important, both of them. Now, verse 3, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh. We have number 8 now, the locusts devour everything. Thus saith the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? That's exactly the point. Can't be saved unless we repent. It takes humility. You're God, I'm not God. You're my Lord, you're I, I surrender to you. Save me. Rescue me. And he will. Because you've got to humble yourself. Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped. Everything else that you put is, is left is going to be gone. What is left to you from the hail? And they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Then your houses shall be filled with the house uh, and the houses of all of your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians. Something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day that they came upon the earth until this day. You've never seen anything like it and you'll never see anything again. And he turned and he went out from, from Pharaoh. So... Um, He's going to give him a story to tell, and uh, he would be able to tell that story if he lives long enough to tell it, but he won't. Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? Your pride has crushed us. It's time. Do it. There's nothing left to protect. Everything has been crushed. But of course he doesn't, does he? They're begging him to turn. By the time people start to beg us, you know, in our lives, why won't you relent? Why are you willing to take more? Why not turn? Is this the way you want it to go down? Uh, don't you see? Everything has been robbed. Your whole life is a shambles. And uh, you're begging them, but they're not, uh, they don't want to, to listen. Their eyes, again, have grown gone dim, and their pride is everything that they have. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, go serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are, um, who are, the ones that are going? So here he comes back in. He says, all right, you can go ahead and serve your God. Now, who are these all that are going? I just want to make sure who, who all now is going. Okay. Moses said, well, we shall go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, we shall go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, well, thus may the Lord be with you if ever I let you and your little ones go. In other words, I'll let you go, but I'm not letting your little ones go. Take heed, for evil is in your mind. Not so. Go now, the men among you, and serve the Lord for that is what uh, you desire. So you guys, you men can go, just leave the children behind here. So um, again, they were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for locusts, for the locusts 
that they may come up on the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land, even all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, can you imagine? It's like an army rolled in and you wake up and you're covered. The east wind brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory. You've been invaded completely by this army uh, of Egypt. They were very numerous. There have never been so many locusts, nor would there um, be so many again. This is, again, a world record. Okay? For they covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Thus nothing green was left on tree or plant of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. You ever seen uh, the devastation that locusts can do? You ever see the pictures? It's just like... Uh, it's like an, at an atomic bomb went off. And it's just, ra there's nothing there. Nothing of color. Everything is gone. Um, so that's exactly what happened. Total devastation they devoured. Verse 16, then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord, your God, and against you. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once. And make supplication to the Lord your God. You know, basically, so people say, well, pray for me. I can pray for you, but you still got to repent. You need to turn. So make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only uh, remove this death from me, you know, because you, could you bail me out here. Right? So he went out from Pharaoh and he made supplication to the Lord. And uh, so the Lord shifted the wind, a very strong west wind, which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. We'll see that again. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. So can you imagine? All that was just flew out into the sea and just were gone. <laughs> Amazing. How fast they came in, how fast they went out. And so the Lord is, this is what's great about the Lord. He can bring those things on because he disciplines even us as believers. He's not going to condemn us for our sin because he's been gracious to forgive us of our sin. But he judges us, doesn't he? And, uh, but, you know, even he doesn't want to do that. But when he does that, again, um, he is firm and God can bring judgment upon us. But if we relent, it's amazing how fast God can remove that from our lives. Isn't that great? Some of us think, man, I've done so much. I, you know, I'll never, I'm going to be paying for that for the rest of my life. Now, listen, give the Lord a chance to be gracious. It's amazing how fast he can put your life back together again. And you won't even recognize yourself, you know. A month from now, you know, a year from now, nobody will recognize you. Are you the same guy again? Wow, what happened to your life? God, he's a God who restores. And again, I know this wasn't a restoration, but this is how quick he can uh, remove those things uh, from our lives. Let's finish the reading here. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt this is our last plague, darkness, uh, nine, and we'll finish 10 uh, later. And he, he said it's going to be dark all over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. Wow. You ever been in something that dark? Ever been spelunking? Okay. I can remember going down in a cave, and that's one of the things they do. They uh, bring you down in this hole. You're under the ground. There's no, no light whatsoever. And you got your little helmet things on. It's okay. Let's turn our lights out. So we're all sitting in, you know, in like a rock thing with one little hole to get out. And uh, we're all down in this little thing. And then they say, okay, turn it out. You can't see your hand in front of your face. It doesn't matter if you wait for a minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, 100 minutes for how many days? Three days. You can't see the hand in front of your face. So dark, it absolutely immobilizes you. This is verse 23. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. God says, I'm going to give you guys some light. <laughs> Without the Lord, there's no light, is there? The Bible says and it describes our eternity without the Lord as utter, outer darkness. 
and it is completely immobilizing. By the way, they put you down in that hole right there to see if you're going to panic. And um, so that's the test. Before they move on to the whole rest, because you're going to crawl through things you don't know if you get through, um, they don't want you panicking way down under the earth. So they just weed out everybody right there. And, and we did. And it was one of my friends. And he was a tough guy uh, up to that point. And then from that point on, we mocked him the rest of his life. But um, tough up until then. No, I'm just kidding. But he, you know, he just knew. Can't, can't do it. Can't do it. And you can see it on his face when the lights come. Turn the lights back on. Turn the lights back on. I'm like, dude, you're 6'3", football player. What are you talking about? You know, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, sorry, guys. You know, it was like an eight, six-hour tour. So we didn't see him for the whole day until we got out the other side. He's like, hi, guys. So anyway. You didn't want to hear that story anyway. So then Pharaoh called to Moses, verse 24, and he said, go serve the Lord. Uh, Let your flocks and your herds be detained. Even your little ones may go with you. Okay, now we've got another deal going, right? But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that uh, we may sacrifice them for the Lord our God. Therefore, our livestock too shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we shall take um, some of them to serve the Lord our God. And until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know with what we shall serve the Lord. Uh, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Then he says this, then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Beware. Do not see my face again, for in the day you see my face, you shall surely die. Do you think Moses was afraid? Are you kidding me? You're going to do what to me? He says, Moses says, you are right. I shall never see your face again. Interesting ending. We'll end there tonight. Great lessons. Amazing how God can be so great and powerful in our lives that the one person that would bring fear to us uh, now as we stand there in the faith of the Lord, we're not afraid at all. Oh, death, where is your sting? Don't be afraid of the one who can take your life. Be afraid of the one who could take your life and put it in hell. That's what Jesus said, right? We don't have to fear anything, for God is with us. Amen? Whom shall I fear with God on my side? He hasn't given me a spirit of fear. I was courage as we live this life for the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we do love you tonight. Great picture lesson, Lord, for us. Give us these lessons. Burn them in our hearts, Lord. You're the great, mighty God. Lord, there is none like you, none, no one to be served but you. And Father, you are great, greater than all of our enemies. The only thing that can get in our way is our foolish um, heart. And Lord, you have now given us a new heart, a heart of flesh, your heart. And Lord, that other heart, Lord, is hard. We want to, Lord, live with this new heart that is obedient and soft and tender, Lord. And uh, Lord, you give us the strength to live every day, Lord, for you. And to take a stand against all of your enemies, Lord, uh, knowing you'll deliver us. We praise you tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.